Welcome to session three of the International Black Writers Festival, day two. Um, I am very excited to welcome you to this next conversation. Um, the celebrated author that we're gonna have a pleasure to, to listen to the conversation is Edgewich Danticat. Edwidge Danticat is a celebrated Haitian American author known for her novels and short stories that explore themes of immigration, identity, and the Haitian diaspora. She gained acclaim with her debut novel, Breath, Eyes, Memory, an Oprah's book club selection. Her other notable works include Crick Crack, The Farming of Bones, and Brother, I'm Dying which won the National Book Critics Circle Award. Danta Katz's latest book, We're Alone, is a collection of eight essays addressing intimate and historical topics such as her personal journey, Haiti's history, parenting, and migration. Danta Katz has received a MacArthur's Genius Grant and the Neustadt International Prize for Literature and is a passionate advocate for human rights, particularly for Haitian refugees and immigrants. The facilitator of this discussion will be by Howard's own Dr. Carol Boyce Davies. Carol Boyce Davies is chair of the English department at Howard University and the H.T. Rhodes Professor Emerita at Cornell University. She is the author of Left at Karl Marx, The Political Life, of black communist Claudia Jones and black women writing an identity migrations of the subject. Her works explore African, Caribbean, and African diaspora literature. Boyce Davies has published over a hundred essays and edited several critical collections, including Moving Beyond Boundaries and the Encyclopedia of the African Diaspora a member of UNESCO's General History of Africa Scientific Committee. She edited the Global Blackness Forum and recently published Black Women's Rights, Leadership, and the Circularities of Power. Please welcome Dr. Boyce Davies. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm so pleased. Um, I'm pleased to be here in this capacity, and you'll see why, why as we begin to talk about this. But I have to give, I want to have to say this before I start, and Ben is here, thank you, he's right there. I want to say that I'm at Howard because of this Writers' Festival, and Ben knows. I was invited here three years ago for the first revision of this festival, and just coming back to HU, which is a university that I cherish and love, I felt this was a good time to think about how I could give back, and an opportunity came, and I accepted it, and I'm happy to be here. Yes. So basically, so you know, it's, I always told people I would never be chair of an English department. I can't understand how this happened. <laughs> so essentially, in fact, at Binghamton, they had asked me to be the chair, and I said, um, I'm for abolishing the English department, and of course I didn't get a vote. <laughs> so, so I want you to know that we are working on a name change. It has already been voted by the department. So it's gonna be the Department of Literature and Writing as soon as it goes through the formal process. So the other nice thing I'm really proud of is that this is Howard University, the home of all the illustrious writers, Toni Morrison, Amiri Baraka, right? Uh, everybody that you want, Tana Hussey Coates, and yet we don't have a strong creative writing program, but this year we started and we do. I want to recognize those new faculty that we hired. AJ Burdell, please stand up. <laughs> is Safiya still here? Safiya Abdurrahman? She was here earlier. There she is, right? Creative nonfiction, we have two faculty members in that area. Nina Angela Mercer is the Eleanor Trailer Postdoctoral Fellow. And we also have others in the audience like Patricia Elam Walker. So, 
So basically, I was telling them, coming from Cornell, where they boast about a creative writing program, we actually have more people here that could really deliver a creative writing program. And we are going to do it, and going forward, this is the plan. So when you're going out, there's a, a brochure that we have that outlines a lot of the material that will tell you who is here and what they plan to do. And um, this will circulate as well online, so you'll get a copy of it in the next day or so. So just letting you know what we're planning to do going forward. We want this to be the place, and it is really, that you should come to for any kind of study of African literature as globally defined. Um, so we have a number of specializations that are being redesigned, a specialization in African literature. We already have a Caribbean lit minor. We're going to have all sorts of other specializations numbering six without excluding the dominant European dominant literatures from our framework because we look at them in terms of the post-colonial context. So I'm really happy to begin our discussion with my dear friend and colleague, Edwidge Danticat. And I was going to say, I love how you got so much business done. <laughs> in, the... in one year. In one year. In one year. <laughs> I was told when I was at FIU, which you know by the person who was the president when I left, that when you go to a new department, you need to, all the things you want to do, you need to do it that first year. Because the second year, people look at you like, really? <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. I'm excited yeah, for the, the creative writing. So at least you set it in motion, and hopefully it will unfold. Okay, so I am really happy to talk to Edwidge Danticat here, and I want to tell her welcome to Harvard University. Just give her a sign. Thank you. Thank you. And I have about 10 questions, but I want to say, first of all, I've been fortunate to have followed your writing trajectory at several critical points. So, but I want to start, and I warned you just before we came on the stage, can we start with that very recent racist malignment of the Haitian community, and by extension, black people in general, given Haiti's iconic meaning in the black world? What is your instinctive response as a writer and thinker, as a Haitian American, as a black woman? How do you feel when you hear those kinds of comments, and how do you respond normally? And what will you tell our audience? Um, well, I, I wrote an, an op-ed in the Washington Post uh, that came out last week that summarizes a little bit of how I feel. Because I grew up, um, you know, I, I came here at age 12 in 1981 in the era of AIDS. And, and at that time, Haitians, we were the only one identified by nationality of being high risk for AIDS. So that meant like, like beat downs after school, being called names. And, um, but at that time, I didn't even realize, you know, I was 12, I just arrived, I didn't realize how far like that anti-Haitian um, hate went back, like to Thomas Jefferson doing the Haitian Revolution, calling us the cannibals of the terrible republic, um, to the US, you know, doing the US occupation with these Marines, you know, who went, when they wrote memoirs after they came out of Haiti, first of all, they were astounded that they were like N-word, like one of them said it like the, Secretary of State of the US doing the US occupation said to think N words speaking French. Like they were astounded by that. And then they wrote these memoirs with titles like, you know, Cannibal Cousins, which then became movies. Like I walked with a zombie. Like that whole notion of zombies like came out of, you know, the US occupation of Haiti. So I didn't know all that then when I was 12 and, and suffering that, but it goes back such a long way. And I think now we have like a terrible brew of, you know, the, the xenophobia and the racism in which like Haitians are being made to stand for like for and global anti-blackness, right? Like in in and exactly anti-immigration. And so I one of the things that I pulled in the essay, um, we were together this summer at um, a conference uh, 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 devoted to Toni Morrison and Amy Césaire, and one of the things I remembered from Ms. Morrison was um, this quote like the, or say the source, the, 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 the function, the very serious, I'm paraphrasing, function of racism is distraction. 
Like, you know, and she said that it keeps you from doing your work. Because if somebody says you have no language, then you spend years trying to prove you have a language. It's, and in this case, this distraction is working, frankly, right? Because we're not talking about cat ladies. We're talking about cat eaters. We're not talking about, you know, a dismal uh, performance in a debate. We're talking about this invasion. And it's working so well for those racists that they're trying it now in Pennsylvania. There's a small town in Pennsylvania, Charles Roy, um, where they're saying again, like, you know, Trump has been saying, oh, yeah, they're, they're ruining your town. So they're trying it in all these different places. I think it's just important for us to recognize what's happening and, um, and to not fall for it. And also to not fall into this thing where we then get on board and like then start, you know, like I had to ask friends, like, don't send me your cat memes. I already have cat in my name. Like I'm <laughs> like, I don't like don't send me the dog. Like it hurts. It it does hurt, but we also have to recognize it for what it is. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't think of that ending. The cat in the name. Wow. You know, I have known you and your work throughout your career. This is so amazing. It, it dates me, of course, and, and us, right? But first, as a young writer, when you were on the road at Binghamton, I met you there, and you had just written Breath Eyes Memory. I remember you had written um, as an autograph in my book, From My Memory to Yours. My students then were blown away by your youth. You were like maybe 25 or something. First of all, as I a young black prof teaching black women writers, we were really pleased to show students what they were capable of being and doing and becoming. So tell me first about that memory and about youth and how you see that period and that classic Breath Eyes memory now. Um, it's like, like a first baby or first something, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's like a first baby in the sense that, I mean, first novels teach you to write because you don't, I didn't really know what I was doing. I'd read novels in school, but I, but I just I knew I wanted to write one, and I was writing it piecemeal. I was writing it, and I don't recommend this to students. But every time I had like a very unrelated exam, the night before I would get a strike of inspiration, <laughs> and it was like it was like productive procrastination. Writing that novel was for me, and so so when it was done, you know, I submitted it to this publisher, Soho Press in New York, and she told me that she says the only reason she read it was that when she came across my name, she couldn't figure out how to address my rejection letter, whether she should address it to Ms. or Mr. We didn't have pronouns, right? <laughs> yeah, and so, and then she said she started reading it, and that's why, and then she wrote me, she said, it's not there yet, but keep going, so that encouraged me. And, and I remember when, you know, it was a small press, Soho Press, and she called me after I had submitted it. And then that encouraged me to go get an MFA, and I wrote it as my thesis. And, um, and then I sent her the thesis, and she said, well, we want to publish it. And I was so naive that I said, how much do I pay you? <laughs> Which blew the negotiations. And, and she said, we pay you, but it's a small amount. So <laughs> But it, but then it, but I, you know, at that point, you were just so happy to to be published. And when I look back on it now, I mean, it's just, it's hard to believe that thirty years, thirty plus years, has gone by because you look the same. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a little confusing. <laughs> oh wow! Yeah, well, you know, but memory though, and and do you see that young woman? And what do you see? What, I, and I see your daughters beautifully 18 and yeah. related ages, right? Yeah, I mean, I, when I see, I was so scared um, doing that whole, and thank God, I think back now, I'm like, thank God there was no social media. Because also the flip side of the book getting published was getting, I got, a, I got heat, I got a lot of heat for it because there is a situation in the book where it's like, Virginity is, is hyper treasured, and and um, and people, you know, sometimes I would reach again in this environment where people make us like there's like there's already terrible things being said about us, and now you come with this thing like mothers test their daughters for virginity, and so there were a lot of people who were actually quite angry, 
with me about that. And I didn't realize, I was like, you know, I would always say like, it says novel on the cover. And, and I, again, I didn't realize that people didn't really take at, at, when at the word for that. So this idea of how, you know, writers, you know, you stand in, I don't think that's asked of like white European writers, but often like writers like us are asked to, you know, your story is meant to represent everybody's story. So that was the, the flip side of that. And I, I, I actually, I mean, I could feel what people were saying. Mm -hmm. um, I understood it, but it was a little bit intimidating. And I think if there was a, a, an environment like we have now, where people were like constantly at me about it, like it would have been harder to like continue. Right. Yeah. I remember seeing you in Haiti and you said um, something like, when you're in Haiti, you can, they can have you on your knees because if you're not speaking Creole, if you're not saying exactly what people want to hear, that is, it becomes oh, quite yeah. a thing. Yeah, that's where you're accountable because it's like, I mean, I, yeah, when I, in, that, in the beginning of that, like everything, not just the books, but like things you write in the press, things you stay in the press were so like, people like took so, carried so much weight, but, I think, I mean, one of the things that's changed, like I, I look back at that young woman now, I think there was a kind of, you know, this book is called We're Alone. There was a kind of, like we weren't, I wasn't alone, I had a community. I was always, I had always lived in Haitian communities, but there weren't many of us writing out there, right? So this week, for example, with these accusations, there've been so many different, you know, had Roxane Gay in the New Yorker, you had people in their local paper. So then it was, there's more of a chorus now, and you, there's yeah, more room right. for different voices. Yeah, Miriam Chancy. Yeah. Yeah, so, right. So another major period was our joint Miami period. So I was, um, after Binghamton, I was hired to direct the African New World Studies program in Miami. How joy at F. Florida International University. And Joanne Hippolyte is in the audience. Hi, Joanne. I didn't recognize Oh, her. Joanne. Right? Hello. She is at the National Museum, but then she ran the Florida Museum, Florida Historical Museum, right? And also an author, right? right. One of those voices that joined the course. Exactly. So how joyful we were as a community, right, Joanne, to have you. Um, and we had just created, when I was at FIU, the Eric Williams Memorial Lecture, and ironically, there's a conference on Eric Williams, Capitalism and Slavery, taking place which took place last week in Havana and this week here. So we created the Eric Williams Lecture with a guest speaker, George Lamming. Now, when I was at Howard here, that was, he was probably the first major writer I encountered, and as you know, yes, yes. blown totally away with this shocking, beautiful hair and this man of all this elegance. So Jake, George Lamming was the speaker who had to cancel at the, at the last minute because I think there was a hurricane impending or something and he couldn't fly. So called Edwidge, and asked if she would definitely speak in his honor or favor. And she said, well, you know, this is quite an honor, but he was my teacher, so I will do it. And graciously, she said yes, and gave an amazing reading with a scholar from University of Virginia named Robert Faton, who the historians may know. I always remember him because he, he spoke about what he calls Haiti's predatory leadership. And I thought he was being so hard on the leaders then, but. I think in some ways his position is, is validated by the various incarnations of that kind of predatory leadership. But you said then that Laming taught you about pace. Mm -hmm. And you said he taught you because you'd written very quickly and he taught you how to slow everything down. And I know there are writers here, potential writers as well. What was the lesson then that you can share that Laming gave you that you can share with our writers in the audience or writers to be in the audience? And particularly, what has George Lamming meant to you and to Caribbean literature? If you can do those two mm -hmm. things, I'll be so happy. I mean, I remember um, there's that, the, the short essay book, I'm forgetting the title, by Lamming was the first thing um, that I read by him. But I was, uh, I was in a, an MFA program at Brown University, and Brown has a very sort of experimental program, and um, and, I looked forward to in the summer, I'd heard about this Caribbean Writers Workshop at, at the University of Miami. So that was before breath, like before, while well, I was still writing Breath Eyes Memory. And, and, and I remember going there and it was, there was George Lamming, you know, great iconic Caribbean writer with this big head of hair. 
And we had this, the way the workshop was, was he was sitting at the head of the ta table in two lines of us. And, and there were two, I think, in, in my group, a, a Haitian writer living, who lives in um, Italy, Marielle in Lafouet, was in one of the fiction classes with me. And I would, at that time, I just was, I think I was coming also from the, and it's some of it you see in Creek Crack. I was writing some of the stories in Creek Crack, and I was coming at like an oral, like a very oral tradition, and I didn't, like my thing was like, I don't want to bore a reader. Like, I just want to get to the story. So my stories were basically like, this happens, and they die. And so, <laughs> and so he was, he, you know, I, and I remember he would read through, he would write through like beats, like he would write notes where it's like, take a beat there. And, and he said, you know, stories are like peaks and valleys, right? It's not all peak, it's not all valley. You have to kind of give the reader a break. Right, you have to you have to let the story breathe, and so he said, "You have good things here, but you have to slow down." And I still had like I think the, that impatience of youth in terms of stories, and it's something that over the years, like you could see if you compare like the stories in Kikrak to like the stories and everything inside, like and and I realized what he wanted, like he closed that by saying, "Trust the reader, trust the reader." And um, and what he what he meant to me was to see um, George La La writers like George Lamming um, and Olive Senior and Kamal Brathwaite who was also teaching in that it was interesting to to like to see them out of the Caribbean it made someone like me seem possible like that you could like um, Paul Marshall did too in a very big way to be kind of like to have um, Paul Marshall had more like a more life that's more like mine, like a bridge life, right? Like, um, but that they would come and that they were like, that we could talk to them. First of all, it was amazing. The first actually real writer I saw in person when I was a student at Barnard was Jamaica Kincaid. And, and she was so fabulous at that time. You know, the whole like, like with the hair, like, yeah, before, yeah, she was, and I, and, and I just remember like seeing a, seeing a writer whose work, like especially Lamming, who's traveled such a long journey, and then to see them in person sitting around talking to a bunch of young writers, uh, to me that, that meant the world. Right, and I, I'm glad you mentioned Paul Marshall because we had given her as well an award called Caribbean Grill Award, and I know she was another major influence on you, particularly that she situated Brooklyn, New York, as a place out of which a Caribbean American identity was shaped. And I have a former student who you know well, who is a filmmaker, who is making a film on Caroline's wedding, uh, Haitian American as well. So how is Brooklyn, Caribbean American community and all of that, um, in terms of location, one of those spaces that you see as fruitful with Marshall and in your own work as well? Well, I mean, Brooklyn that was the first, like the place where I landed at 12 years old. And um, I remember it was in a, a building in a cul-de-sac called Westbury Court. And there were a lot of, you know, like Haitian families in the building, but also other Caribbean families and African-American families. But on, the, on Sunday, the, the Haitian families would take turns after church, like having these um, Sunday dinners in, in each other's homes. So just, I mean, it was difficult. Again, it was that time of the 1981 with AIDS, and a lot of people in that building lost their job during that whole um, era of that accusation. But there was a sense of community there. And, and for, you know, for the longest time, I thought you know, Brooklyn felt like, like a microcosm of the world. Because even when, you know, in high school, I did uh, I, we took classes at the community college in dual enrollment. I remember going to Kingsborough. You have that experience where you go on the on the bus and then gradually you leave your neighborhood and you see like you go through Bay Ridge and it just starts changing. So I mean, to, even to be able to, to to see that. But Marshall, you know, I wrote a little bit of this in a forward. I was asked to write for Brown Girl um, Brownstone. I remember reading that and thinking that's exact like that's what my parents were were doing like trying to buy a house like i those conversations felt so familiar to me and of course her idea of the kitchen 
um, the poets in the kitchen and the way she felt about these conversations that seemed very casual, um, but were so poetic. Amazing. Mm -hmm. And ironically, those houses end up being very, very valuable now. With Lord, millions. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh my God. Miami still, that uh, much my line, Haitian community, and you captured it so well in terms of my brother, I'm dying, but also the Brooklyn Haitian uh, Miami connection. It's a memoir of sorts, but a documentation of family and the US continued inability to deal with it, the problems it creates, right? So, in other words, Cuba is a problem for the US because there's an embargo for 75 years and people can't do all the developmental projects they had in mind and so on. And then they worry about Cubans coming through the passage and so on. In other words, that's just one example. But Haiti is another example, isn't it? Uh, and by the time your uncle comes to the United States, he is treated in such a horrible xenophobic way, um, which is a shade of that same way that the president treated Haitians recently and all of us. I would argue. Um, what are your thoughts on that continued um, anti-immigration, anti-migrant US position when the US is a nation of immigrants? Uh, I mean, I think like during the last Trump time, they even removed that from, from some of the sites, like the US is a nation of immigrants, like they removed that, um, that, that language, but... Um, no, I, I, people never go to like the root causes, right, of migration and a lot of things. I mean, there's many reasons um, why, including, um, again, like the predatory <laughs> nature of leadership that Faton um, talked about. But one of the like the more immediate reasons driving migration in Haiti now is the dumping of like U.S.-made weapons. Right, and so you have these armed groups with like guns that cost thousands and thousands of dollars coming from the U.S. That's I mean that there's many issues at play, but the immigration um, part. This year there was the 50th anniversary of the first um, people who came by boat to Florida, um, and there were many celebrations, including one service. Um, it was last like last year, but one of the services I. Uh, that kicked off was uh, at an African American church that in in Miami that had housed um, Haitian arrivals like 50 years ago, and they had you know the the son of the preacher was there, so there was that that continuity. But in that conversation, as the 50 years, um, you know we you get to reflect about Guantanamo. Guantanamo, as you know it now, was made Guantanamo to house. Haitian asylum seekers who were coming by boat, and they were they were held in these you know behind barbed wires, and at that time you know the the people who were HIV positive couldn't they went on strike, and um, that whole the whole way like the detention a lot of the detention system mechanism like the, of that is now in the U.S. was built around Haitian um, asylum seekers. Um, after a coup, and then a lot of those people who ended up on Guantanamo went there after a coup d'etat that years later was in the New York Times, it's not a conspiracy, it was like backed by the CIA. Wow. So that, that sort of like that circularity, it's like a, like a, like a, a friend, like Jean Dominique in the film The Agronomist, uh, who was a very famous radio journalist in Haiti, used to say it's like, you know, and I think Audrey Lorde said something similar, like the asking the, the arsonist to put out the fire, you know. Right, it's interesting, but you one of the first people, I read a story you wrote, and I can't remember where, where you talked about gangs, and I didn't really have a sense of gangs in Haiti um, until this recent version of these, these barbecue and, and so on. Uh, and my friends in Miami have so many stories about that, but in one of your stories, you have a kidnapping that I think is the one called Dorsus, is the very first one, um, that is a kind of trick played on a woman who is working very hard as a nurse provider, caretaker of somebody. So I think what you try to do as well is provide that internal critique as well as the external critique. Is it harder to do that, do you think? Because often when we, particularly for black women writers, when we do that internal critique, we get a lot of pushback from others 
um, saying that we bring out the dirty linen and all that. What do you think about that? I mean, I, th I think certainly the internal critique is, is necessary. And it's been like, you know, I just watched this, um, this film that will be out soon by uh, a young filmmaker named Etan Dupin called The Fight for Haiti. And he, the whole film, the film starts out being centered around um, this campaign uh, around this petro caribe money that, so the, the, there's money um, borrowed from Venezuela and this oil, um, you know, buy oil from, buy, you know, fuel from Venezuela at a certain price and then you use the, the at very low interest and then you, they were like the, the government at that time, the, the party that was supposed to use the money to develop, you know, for development, but they wasted, it was squandered. And so there was a whole movement around that. And, um, and so I, the film goes through that and goes to this moments of, you know, of the armed groups, but also starts to examine at the end, they do go into, it's interesting to see young people also going into internal, crit, you know, critiques of, of race and class and colorism and ways that, you know, so that's, that, I, th I think that conversation also is also being had. I, um, perhaps, you know, in, in fiction, you can, you can, it's kind of like um, when I was a kid and you would go to a health fair and someone was acting out some principle. I feel, I think like in fiction, you could, you could show scenarios in which these things are happening in a way that models real life, but, um, but, this issue of armed groups too, um, and Haiti, I think in the Caribbean, and I saw it in the neighborhood where my uncle lived um, because a lot, it started a lot with people who were deported from, from prisons right. in the US, and, um, and if they didn't have community ties, sometimes they started grouping together and so when my uncle lived in the neighborhood, like when I would go back, they were like, that's the, it started out like Baz, that was the Baz, that was like the base. And a lot of the, they spoke English. My uncle had this school and he sometimes hired some of them to teach English wow. to, um, so you, you saw that developing. And in other places in the Caribbean, they were dealt exactly. with brutally, right? Yeah. But a lot of armed, like these armed groups started with people with who were, in Latin America too, yeah. Well, there you go. That's another of those problems created by the U.S. and then shipped abroad. It's really amazing. Um, the the other relationship that is really an in, internal in critique, and we don't see too much of it. But I went to a funeral in Haiti for a friend of ours, who you know is an artist, and it, the the entire I think I was the darkest person there. So there's a whole Haitian biracial, so-called mulatto, they call themselves mulatto class, um, which really blows your mind. I'm like, wow. And they live a way that nobody else lives. I mean, the level of, of staff and people serving them and all of that is beyond. Has anybody really written a lot about talking about that aspect of the internal critique? And I know you've done it with the DR because I was quite, I was so impressed with the fact that when the diaspora Aswed was going there, and the Aswed people were really upset, Edwidge refused to go to the DR um, because of the racism of the DR against um, Haitians. And you've written well about that in the farming of bones. So I know it's both ways because in the DR they have all these regulations about Haiti Haitians born after I think 1926 um, cannot 29. be 29. 29, yeah. okay, and then. And then you have the internal version of that, where you have a whole class, um, wealthy and, and, and racially defined very specifically um, as well. How can we understand that to an audience here, like this audience? I mean, I, I, mean, I think probably this audience understands it better um, than other audiences, in spite because sometimes when, when you remove other things, right, then, then you have these like you have colorism, you have some internal, um, you know, tensions, class, and um, but there are writers. I think some old, actually older writers, as you know, Marie Vieux Chauvet, I think who's uh, I think she deals uh, with it very well. But for, from another era, of course, in her novel uh, *Amour, Couleur, Folie*, *Love, Anger, and Madness*, and um, I, I oh. think 
I think older Haitian literature probably right. addresses like colorism um, more than perhaps the, the contemporary. The contemporary. Which yeah. Is interesting. Yeah. And but also I think we just like what you're saying, it's so sometimes so different. Like I, I mean I, I we went someplace together <laughs> that one time in Haiti, and I was like, I was as confused as you were. I was like, this exists here, right. you know? So, um, so that wasn't, like, I, I, didn't, I, I didn't have access to that. Like, I didn't know it at you all. You know what it was, Jemima Peer. Do you all know Jemima Peer's work? Um, predicament of Blackness. We went to a, a reception sponsored uh, by somebody who's married to a, a famous plastic surgeon in um, Miami, but has an amazing house in, in, in um, Port-au-Prince. And Jemima and Edwidge said to me that if we were here before, we'd probably be working in the house. <laughs> if, you know, if we hadn't come back as, as, as scholars and writers, we'd be working here. I'm like, oh God, this is not good. <laughs> anyway, I, I taught a class at Cornell, completely on your work. You, you should be pleased to know that the students were so engaged that I had a Nigerian student, Nigerians, if you were in the house, you'd understand, who came to tell me that after your class, after that class, he wanted to be a jazz musician and he wanted to change his major. Knowing, knowing the Nigerian. Did, did you get a letter man, from his man, parents? Knowing the Nigerian community at home and abroad, I studied in Nigeria. I told him he could do both. You could do both. In my introduction, then I said, I wanted to tell him that, you know, tell you that your publications and your work have so inspired many that they saw the possibility of creativity in many different ways. So you almost had a pre-med student leaving to become. I, I, we're going to be cursed by their parents. I know. Right, I know. But we cannot close without talking about Howard and Zora Neale Hurston and Toni Morrison. Uh, I know Toni Morrison's place in our joint frameworks are so significant and so stellar. She loved everything about your work. Uh, for Howard, she is our department and our university's preeminent product. But she was really critical of the Eurocentric orientation of such departments as the one we are in, at, I mean at Howard, even at an HBCU. But you talked at the recent conference in Martinique, as did I on Morrison's activation of an African diaspora framework in a lot of her work, knowing continental and African diaspora writers. Tell us, as we close out this part, about Tony Morrison's impact on you and your engagement. Of course, we have A.J. Verdell, Miss Chloe um, back there, who wrote um, about her close relationship with Toni Morrison. So I'd love for us to close on that really powerful point about Morrison's impact. On yeah. I mean, what a, what, that, would, that would a beautiful way uh, to close. Um, I feel, you know, having uh, read Miss Chloe, similarly to A.J., A.J., you know, spent much more time with Ms. Morrison. But I, like, of course, every time I saw her, I was in awe. And then I would always be like, I would always be amazed. I was like, she likes me. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and was always, was, I think what the most moving thing was like the, the kindness and like the consideration. For example, when she was, you know, I've, told that story um, when she was invited to the Louvre and, um, and I remember her assistant, Renee Boatman, called me and said, Ms. Morrison would like to, you to join her at the, at the Louvre. And I had, you know, I had such a case, like a big imposter syndrome case, like, um, and I was like, you sure she means me? And then, and then I was like, I don't think I can do it. And I actually said, no, I was like, no. And then the next day she calls. She, <laughs> Like, and she was like, um, what would, she's like, what do you need? And then I had a newborn, I had, I said, I have a newborn, and she's like, well, she's gonna grow. And then, <laughs> <laughs> it's in six months, like, and so, and I, and I had pneumonia, I said, I have pneumonia, it's like, you're gonna get better. <laughs> and, and, and sure enough, like, and then we, she had a set up where she's like, my mother and my mother-in-law to watch to watch the, my daughter so I, we could go to the programs. Even though the first night at the reception, she told my, my, my mother and my mother-in-law, who she knew had come to help with the baby, she's like, 
you all should go out on the town. And she was like, don't, don't babies, like go out on the town. She was just always, um, for reasons that I didn't fully understand, very kind to me. And I think that, that um, I, always, I always keep that in mind, the sense that like the continuity of that, like when you are seen by people, like by the people who've come before you in that, in that way. So that's a, that's a, I mean, I know you feel her as like such a special presence in this place. But that was an extra layer to her that I think both AJ and I benefited from, like this idea that someone can be more than like someone you read on the page, like more than a presence at events, but that also could have a, a, a beautiful soul. That's so beautiful. So I wanted to ask you, I hope you don't mind, just read a little bit for us, maybe a paragraph or two, because we can't close without hearing your voice, and I think audience would be very gratified. Okay. So I'll read like at the end of this book. It's called We're Alone, but we're not really alone, just so you know. Uh, so this, this is a bit about the essay. So during the pandemic, my daughter was taking an essay um, writing class, and I got very envious and jumped on the Zooms with her. Um, <laughs> but I think it says a lot about some beautiful things about the essay. It's very short. During the summer of 2020, my daughter Mira took a writing class online. Taught by the writer Erica N. Cardwell, the class was called Writing the Self. Mira and I were both won over by the course description. Imagine the essay is a body of water far flung and teeming into the distance, and you, the writer, are alone on shore. Will you enter the water? And if so, how will you swim? Or will you stand on shore as the water splashes against your ankles? I wish I could take this class, I told Mira. What I meant was that I wished I could have taken this class when I was 15. I have read most of the assigned essays and revisited some, which I read aloud to Mira. We read When We Dead Awaken, writing as revision by the poet Adrienne Rich, where she told us that writing is renaming. We then read Audre Lorde's Poetry is Not a Luxury, where Lord reminds us there are no new pains. We have felt them all already. And in August 30th, 1979 interview between the two women, Lorde cites her core poem, need a call for black women voices, which is about the frequent silence around the lives and deaths of murdered black women and girls. How much of this truth can I bear, she wrote. How much of this truth can I bear to see and still live unblinded? How much of this pain can I use? Thank you, and you have been treated to an amazing encounter with Edwidge Dandigat. From my experience, these are the more memorable experiences beyond taking the various classes we take, but encountering the real life writer, and you just have had that experience. This program was brought to you by WHUT and made possible by contributions from viewers like you. For more information on this program or any other program, please visit our website at whut.org. Thank you.